Before we get into today's episode, we're gonna first hear from our sponsor. This is the new Autel Maxi Charger AC Lite. Look at that, that is stunning. I really like the look there. I like the grip, it's like a really rigid rubber, kind of firm, but feels very soft. All right, we're gonna use this uh, 220 outlet here. This is kind of towards the back of the garage by my air compressor. So we got lights flashing here. I'm just linking the device to my phone here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna add one. All right, we linked, linked Bluetooth, now we're gonna link Wi-Fi. Now we are linked on Wi-Fi. Set price, there we are. So there it shows you, we've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and powers on. Now we're gonna play the game of will it reach? So I've got it all the way back there, and let's see if it stretches all the way to the back of the car. And it reaches. The cable is very, very flexible, and it'll work even down to very, very cold temperatures, so if you're charging outside. The new one says it's charging. So the version I've got is hardwired and it can charge up to 50 amps. 37 miles will be added per charging hour. So using Altel's charge app, control your charger, manage charge times, schedule the charging to take advantage of off-peak electricity hours. It is Bluetooth and Wi-Fi enabled. So if you're in the market for a home electric vehicle charger, check out Altel. Guess what arrived? All right, these are the battery modules I got. These are LG Chem, lithium ion. They're 1.6 kilowatt. They have a nominal voltage of 25.06. And I got 28 of them. So better get out the scale, see how much each one weighs. All right, 18.2 pounds. So almost 510 pounds in batteries. I believe these are gonna be thermistors and cell taps for the battery modules. This one looks like it's got more of the same. All right, I did notice um, some of the battery modules did not make it all the way intact. So I don't know if those are uh, important features. Looks like this one's gone too. All right, so you may be wondering why I chose these batteries. So to power the rear drive unit, we need the ability to discharge around 1200 amps. So that's over a thousand amps. With both motors, we need to be closer to like 1800, almost 2000 amps. So the battery pack in a Model S can do that. Um, it can give you a 300 mile range as well. It also weighs about 12 to 1300 pounds, just for the batteries. So remember that guy? That's only about 1500 pounds. So you're doubling that just in batteries. So if I wanna kinda of keep um, a lighter sports car, we need to get a more power dense battery. So the Tesla cells, the ability to deliver the 1800 amps, they need almost 1300 pounds of batteries. I only need about 500 pounds of batteries to do the same thing. I will sacrifice a little bit on the range, but again, I think for a lightweight sports car, that'll be worth it. All right, I feel like I can't leave the topic of battery selection without talking about energy density versus power density. So energy density, it means it can hold a lot of energy, but it doesn't necessarily like to give it all up quickly. So it gives off just a little bit, and if we wanted to get a lot of energy, essentially we need to have a lot of batteries. So all these kind of then can, deliver the amount of power we need. But again, it wa wants to give it up very slowly. So this is very much like the Tesla cells. The 18650 cells, again, it's got a lot of those and you need a lot of those to be able to kind of get all the power you need. Power dense, this is more, uh, I will say like hybrid type batteries where it can discharge everything very quickly, it can charge very quickly. So this one, it's like giving up, it's giving up all its energy very quickly. So I chose the power dense batteries to give up all the power very quickly. That way I need a lot less of them to get the power I need. Anyway, I just wanna make sure you are aware that there are kind of different battery types and this is why I chose the batteries I did. And remember the 1800 amps is if you were kind of, I'll say doing a quarter mile, you know, where you're trying to get, extract the most amount of power out of these units. Most of the time when you're driving, it's 
It's only about 100 or 200 amps normally when you're driving just freeway or other ways around town. All right, so this is a pre-charge relay. I believe these are contactors. Yeah. Oh, baby. Is this a fuse holder? the size of that fuse. Holy cow, I can't even fit my hand around that. I got two 800 amp fuses. Looks like these are already seeing a little corrosion. I can clean those up though. That is insane. gone over this in previous episodes, so I'm gonna go ahead and consolidate, free up some whiteboard space. I'm gonna list some of the things that should be considered when designing a battery box. So first off, secure the load. So my battery box, uh, we've got about 500 pounds of batteries. That's a lot of mass that's gonna be going through some G's when you're kind of accelerating, stopping, turning. You don't want this thing kind of going all around, so it needs to be secure. The unsecured load shoots forward with momentum of up to 30 times its weight. Another thing I'll say about secure the load, um, we want to make sure it's a little bit uh, vibration dampened as well. We kind of don't want to be shaking the batteries around. For me, this was a hard lesson I learned last time, but the high voltage has to be very much isolated from your 12 volt system and from the chassis. <laughs> All right, so I'm writing thermally stable. What this means is your batteries, they really like to be around the same temperatures that humans like to be. So I'm gonna say kind of between 60 and 80 Fahrenheit. They can go down to even like freezing or they can go up to about 140, but really ideally you'd like to keep them in that narrow band. That's where they charge and discharge the best. I'm adding another one here. This is connect the battery modules electrically. So again, we've got 500 pounds of batteries, we're gonna secure them all. They're gonna be electrically isolated from other systems. We're gonna make sure that they're thermally stable. We also have to make sure that the batteries themselves are connected in a way that can actually get the voltage and amperage that we need. All right, so for weather resistant, what this means is we want it to be able to drive through puddles and not short out electrical connections. If it's kind of a completely sealed system, if, but I think water is kind of one of the main ones. So we wanna make sure this is kind of watertight. Here I'm going to list some things that the battery box outputs as well as some of the inputs that are required. For my application, I'm running dual Tesla motors. Uh, these require kind of between 300 and 400 volts. One of the things the battery modules have is they've got thermistor outputs. So basically it's going to output the temperature of various battery cells. This is important to communicate to the rest of the system so that we know if we need to increase cooling, increase heating, um, shut systems down, things like that. Similar to the temperature readings, it'll also give the cell voltage readings. These are the readings of the individual cells, so we'll know if the cells are well balanced, uh, if one's high, low, um, any sort of problems there with the voltage. So I'm gonna label this one cooling, although it could be cooling and heating. What this means is if the battery pack is too high in temperature or too low in temperature, the outside system, so outside of the battery box, has the ability to kind of pump in cooling or heating fluid to get the batteries in the right temperature. I wrote charging and discharging. This is essentially cables coming to or from the battery box. So this will allow the batteries to charge or to discharge. I'm also putting cell balancing here. So charging, discharging, that's kind of supplying the whole pack with power or taking power from the pack. The cell balancing, this is actually using the small cell tap wires and actually adding a little bit or subtracting a little bit from the individual cells to kind of keep the whole pack balanced. So I'll see if I can show you in CAD, I'll probably try and design up some things um, that should help visualize a little bit, but uh, this is kind of one of the harder things about doing an EV conversion is, I'll call it the creating. You have to come up with a design that's not been done before, and it has to meet kind of all the needs, all the inputs, all the outputs. Um, it's a fun problem, but again, this is one of the more challenging things. All right, the other thing I'm gonna talk about real quick is um, bus bars and cable sizing. So again, if I'm looking to discharge, say like 1800 amps, you need a serious cable to do that. 
All right, so we're gonna say this is a cable cross section. Now here you've got kind of a jacket, um, kind of some high voltage protection. This is what gives you your voltage rating. So again, we need at least 400 volts. Most cabling this size gets you like a thousand volts. The inside though, this inside diameter, this is the cable diameter. This is how much current it can carry. The biggest one here in the States that's uh, somewhat normal for this sort of application is a 4-0 or 4 aught cable. In Europe or other places, you can get that. So if you look up, um, lots of times there's tables or guidelines about how much current these can take. So 296 or 300 amps. So 230 amps. All right, so these are some of the biggest cables out there for electric vehicle conversions. And if I'm talking about like 1800 amps, you might be saying, how does that work? So the way it works is this is rated for that for a long period of time. And electric vehicles, again, they may run like this for 10 seconds, but that's about it. So electric vehicles and things have lots of temperature sensors and other things that will limit the current if temperatures rise. So it uses kind of some of these sorts of cables, but it'll limit it based on temperature. So what I've done for my bus bars and things is I have taken the cross-sectional area and made sure that they're equal. The cabling for the rear motor is about two aught gauge, but because I'm doing both rear and front motor, um, I'm gonna use four aught or similar bus bar sizing. I am in the process of designing some bus bars um, I'm actually going to be 3D printing these just because I want to make sure they fit before we order them out of copper. All right, so I made up this one. So this one has some bends. So this part here will be fastened to the battery terminal. It'll actually kick up a little bit. And then from this point, we'll be able to create all the other bus bars. So one of the things that's uh, important here, so I maximized the uh, surface area, the contact area for the battery terminal. And the battery is going to put out a lot, but um, I'm actually going to be putting two batteries together. So when it comes out here to this area and when I connect it to other batteries, it needs to kind of be double the cross-sectional area. But first things first, we're going to go ahead and 3D print this. Don't tell my son we're going to use his 3D printer. He says he doesn't like this white filament very much. So we'll go ahead and print with it. All right, it says two hours, 14 minutes, just starting. Had some build problems, some delamination there, and these ones almost, they look a little banana. So like, I don't know why, but it pulled away from the tray. So it looked a lot smaller in CAD, but this is too long. I want it to go maybe half that much. Here's the second attempt. So it fits on pretty good, gives me some good spacing. I think I might want it just a little higher than this so I can have bus bars go across. All right, one of the other problems I'm seeing is I put that down, there's not really a space for the nut to thread on. So I've got to make this out of thinner material. All right, here it is. So we got enough threads on there that we can secure the nut. How much for 3D printed parts? A lot. More? Yeah. All right, there is my 600 pound battery pack. I figure 500 pounds of batteries and 100 pounds of just containment. The problem is, I got a couple problems. I thought this would work great, but uh, number one, this is too wide to go up through the rails of the lift. Again, that's not the biggest problem. Um, the bigger problem is, let's see, so here's like the rail, the frame rail, and it kind of comes at this back surface, then it kind of curves in and over. And so it would kind of be okay until about here. So we need it to be okay until about here. So we don't have enough room for 
seven wide. So we'll have to figure out a better option. I mean, this, this place is big right here. I mean, this whole, this whole cavern should hold a lot of batteries. I was just hoping it'd be seven by four and that would make everything really easy, but that's not going to be how it goes. Wasn't I saying recently that gone are the days of doing things with cardboard? After all, I did scan this car. We should be able to come up with something better. I don't know what I was thinking. Let's get to CAD. I've tried things in CAD board. I also looked at my scans that I did, uh, the 3D scans, and uh, the battery box, yeah, it's not gonna work. Uh, we also confirmed that with CAD board. So I'm gonna come up with something new. I'm gonna walk you through the battery box design here. Um, this, it's kind of a jumbled mess. It's hard to see what's going on, but this is the scan um, of the engine bay. So basically we had to fit everything inside this envelope. With my CAD board, I was really hoping that I could fit everything into this large section right here. And it just, it wasn't gonna happen. It was just a little too wide and it couldn't, couldn't all fit in there. Um, the other thing is the motor placement um, also didn't really allow for that. So I'm gonna call this one the rear battery box. I will get some plates made that has this uh, copper tubing that's kind of sunk into an aluminum plate and that really helps with the cooling. So I'm gonna have a cooling plate on top, one on bottom and one also in the middle. So you'll see the cooling the exits here, exits here and then here. So I've got a plate here that is actually hidden. It's transparent so you can see through it. But that's what it'll look like. So this actually only sinks through halfway so I can still get a ceiling surface below these. And then these ones I've got, these are cable glands and I'm gonna have the copper tubing come out through that and I'm gonna seal around it. This will be for all the cell tap wires as well as the thermistor wires. And I've got this, uh, this really tight constraint left to right so I don't have any extra room on the left or right. This will be the main, where the main power comes in or goes out, however you want to view it. But this will be the most negative power terminal. I made all these bus bars. So this is the bus bar coming from this connector and then going to the first battery. So I'm going to say the first battery. What I'm actually doing is I'm linking two batteries and treating them as one. This is how Tesla and a lot of other companies do it. So again, I could get by with half the batteries but to get the amperage that I'm looking for to drive both motors, I need kind of twice as many batteries and linking them together like this. So basically this is one battery and that's why I'm linking, I'll call this the negative side to the negative side. So this one battery, that's the first battery. Then what I do is I come to this side and then I'm linking the positive side of this battery to the positive side of that battery. And then over here, linking the negative side of the second battery to the negative side and so on and so forth. And this is where it'll come out. The things to think about um, structurally, um, these are some nice thick aluminum plates. I think they're a little over a half inch, maybe closer to three quarter inch. And I've got these holes here and I've got some half inch threaded rod that I'm gonna kind of compress these together. Um, I'm not gonna screw them down tight, but just really to make sure they don't go anywhere and I'll have um, big flange nuts that will um, keep things in place, not allow things to rattle loose. Um, these side plates, these will all just be screwed into the top, bottom, and middle plates. So that is the rear battery box. Um, I'll turn on the motor bay again. And so you can see we are really tight left to right. And this is kind of the back bumper. So this all fits um, underneath the trunk in, in front of the bumper. So this is kind of where all the exhaust was and part of the transmission. All right, so we'll hide this again. We'll go to the next one. I'll call this one the center battery box. So again, this is the most negative and this one's gonna come up and come into here. Same story where we've got uh, these two are one battery tied into here, tied into here, so on and so forth. And it'll come out here. So that's kind of the electrical side of things. The cooling side, I had to stack these battery modules, um, I'll call them vertically. So I've actually got cooling plates um, in between each of these instead of top and bottom in between. 
So this is what they look like. And they'll have coolant flowing in and out on each one of these. And so I've got a manifold here so the cooling will come in. I've only got a couple of these populated just to make sure there's clearance, but I'll have cooling essentially going into one, out to the other, into this one, out to that one, in, out, so on and so forth. So we've got manifolds, so cooling will come in here, go to all of them, come back here, go out. I already talked about voltage coming in, coming out. This is where all these cell tap wires and thermistor wires will come out of this side. So basically that one fits kind of up top, kind of where the uh, motor was, a lot of the motor. So that's where that one goes. So this last one, it just has six battery modules, but again, this one will come out. Yes, it'll come out here, go in here. So again, these are tied together. Then all these four, so the, those two, as well as these two are tied together. These are tied together and it goes down to these. And then this is the most positive output. So then it'll go to the contactor. This will be the positive contactor. This is the most negative. It'll come here. So from this cell back here all the way to here. And this goes through our fuses and then to our negative contactor. This will go to our connector set. One will go to the rear motor, one will go to the front motor. Here, this is the pre-charge relay, and here's the pre-charge resistor. And that'll go to the positive contactor. I've got some fuse holders here for some of the high voltage accessories, like AC or heat, or the charger. So water cooling for this one, it's here and here. So it's got big cooling channels. Structural, got some big uh, holes, tie downs with bolts half inch bolts. I believe this addresses all the things we put on the whiteboard. So structurally, we got big thick aluminum plates. We got half inch threaded steel rods. That we're gonna put in with nuts to secure everything in place. Everything's got connectors, bus bars, all the cell tap wires, thermistor wires. I think everything's completely closed off. It can be sealed from the elements. So this is what it's gonna look like. I believe everything fits, it's a tight fit. So next we'll look at how to mount all this to the actual frame. But for this episode, this is where we're gonna end it, showing the battery box design. Love to hear any comments. Let me know if anything can be done better. Battery box design took 40 hours. Let me tell you with CAD, lots of times uh, in previous builds, I just like to get materials and just kind of create without much planning. And I can tell you that um, with planning, I probably save myself over a hundred different issues where I'd run into things and think like, oh, no, this is backwards. Oh, it can't fit here. So I saved myself a ton of time. I did do uh, a lot of time. So I think that'll help and pay dividends when the parts come. Also adding the uh, motor positioning and for the brakes. So I haven't spent it yet, but the battery box, again, that'll cost uh, a little bit to get all those materials. So I'll put that up when I know what they are. That was a lot of time that I had to spend on this one. Not all of it was uh, video worthy, but again, I gotta show you the end result and I think we'll do very well. Can't wait to get all those materials, build the box, show you how it does. That'll do it for this time. See you next time. Were you always like that? I feel like you were not always like that. How much for three different parts? Hold on, How much did you do? More? No. Let's go!